Welcome back to the Remote No Pressure Podcast, Bill. Hey, it's good to be back. It is good to be it back. Is. It's always good to be back. It's Take good two. To be. Take two. There's not a delay in, in our in our mics like there is on the interview, and we still interrupt each other. It, that's that's just us, though. I say we, but it's really me interrupting you, Bill. I know. So this so is. I, oh. <laughs> This is the second intro we've done because the first one was not quite recorded and kind of a dumpster fire yeah, considering our me. guests. That was me. Well, no, no, it wasn't a dumpster fire because of our, no, you considering. No, no, it was a dumpster fire because considering our guests, like we have to put on. We're prof- trying to be we, professional here. Trying to be very professional. And I'm, I'm not even being very professional. I'm screwing things up with the hitting the buttons and. Uh, before, yeah. we, before we get started, are you, are you recording audio and video, Bill? Audio and video. We're good. Look at that. Oh, dude, that's excellent. So, so awesome, dude. And before we go too far, you should probably talk about our sponsors. See, and that's, that's the thing, Bill. You, you're staying on top of things. You know, I, I'm going to pull up our sponsor, but you, <laughs> I've got nothing. <laughs> I've got no, but, but you see, it was when you missed the cue because, see, we have been trained in this particular ad. There's a certain spot when I say drum roll, please, and you go... <laughs> But that's not a drum roll. Nope. But for, for like weeks, you miss the cue. All together. And then the last episode when I'm like, drum roll, please, you actually got it. <laughs> <laughs> New toys in I the know. studio. I know. But beer lovers know the names, and I'm not talking about your local spaceship fruity IPA. I'm talking about the names in this competitive beer landscape. Two-hearted drunken monks, Pliny elders, and grapefruit space time machines agree that there's a new name in town. It's the International Beer Challenge Award winner of 2020, Bend, Oregon's Craft Beer Award winner in 2020, one of the top-selling beers in Whole Foods, this unbelievable IPA, only has 70 calories, and drumroll, please... Oh, son of a... It's not alcoholic. I love craft beer, and it's hard not to when you live in Michigan, but I've had to cut back. Nothing takes a harder toll on my body like a local craft IPA, although some people claim that dad bod is so hot right now. I I just don't believe them. I don't. You, do you know where that's from? It's so uh, hot Is that right Napoleon now. Dynamite, probably? No, Zoolander. Zoolander. What, what? It's so hot right now. <laughs> Will Ferrell. Uh, Athletic Brewing's Run Wild IPA is a non-alcoholic, fully brewed IPA, not diluted, and it's the Low Calorie Award. Award. Award winning IPA. Have this beer or any of their brews shipped directly to your doorstep and save 20% with your discount code BEERMONEY20. I'm not going to screw it up this time. BEERMONEY20. <laughs> Go to Athletic Brewing, enter the code BEERMONEY20 to experience this new name. Name. Again, theathleticbrewing.com and enter the code BEERMONEY. 20 money that's i mean that's beer money who doesn't want beer money that's true what is the restoration depot.com bill are you speaking you know what this is a great ad placement mm. for this particular week because we have steve here mm-hmm. i was who, thinking about that during the interview were you really i was i was see you're just on top of things no. bill i i wish i could you know what it is it's all the uh, bulletproof coffee. It's the the um, co- what is it? The the stuff you put you know, <laughs> the, coke. The, the, the cocaine. <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> we have a professional guest. I can't talk about that kind of stuff this week. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> we can't talk about that kind of stuff, Bill. But I'm really happy that that uh, you were aware of this particular um, thing. But you do meditate occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. Right. We talked a little bit about this, yep. but um, the re- RestorationDepot.com, the RestorationDepot.com provides a one-stop shop for virtual wellness services that supports emotional, social, physical, and intellectual well-being of indi- individuals. So if, for instance, you want to do meditation, and now this is really far out there, Okay. And I'm not kidding. And everyone needs to go to the website, the the restoration depot.com and click on it because you could, you too could learn to play spirit Jim Bay. Spirit Jim Bay. You say Jim (laughs) Bay D it's spelled with a D spirit. The Jim Bay. The the Jim Bay. So you you, like, that's something that was really big in like the nineties, maybe early two thousands. But evidently, it's some kind of spiritual instrument, and you can learn how to play the djembe. There's other things you can do too, 
But the gym bay class actually kind of caught my eye. Do you think I should bring the gym bay in, just show you my progress, kind of no, how things are going? Not at all. Let's what, talk about your meditation skills. Okay, but what if I conjure <laughs> up some kind of spirit with my gym bay? Is that what you want to be uh, promoting? No. I used to have a gym bay, though. It had like the African colors on this, on it, you know? Oh, wow, yeah. And I used to play it. Remember the early uh, 2000s? Some of those bands would always bring in a gym bay. Just a gym bay <laughs> and maybe a hand symbol. <laughs> yeah! But I like the djembe. It's like three drums in one. And who knew it was like a spiritual instrument? But if you want to learn to play the djembe or maybe learn how to meditate, you can go to therestorationdepot.com. Just guys, just go check it out and look at the djembe class. And let me know. <laughs> Give me your feedback. I'm thinking of teaching. Sign up below with how many people are uh, signed up for the uh, djembe class. The Comment j- below, yeah. Djembe class. If things work out, maybe we could like at our live events have a uh, djembe drum circle. There we go. <laughs> You know, I'll play some hacky sack and call it a night. <laughs> yeah, smoke a little reefer. <laughs> you know, what is that stuff? Chip- Chipotle? No, uh, <laughs> not Chipotle, but what is that stuff that they uh, they smell with? You know what I'm talking about? Chipu- ch- chipuli? Oh, patchouli. 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 Chipuli? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds very bad. <laughs> there chipuli. Was a, there was an intern in the music department that used to always wear chip- uh, patchouli. Was it Wendy? No. No, JC. Ah, JC. I, I don't remember that. I don't remember her smell. But that's kind of odd that you do, Bill. That was a long and time ago, wasn't gypsy. it? Gypsy. She was a gypsy. Eastern European, actually. Mm-hmm. She was an Eastern European uh, gypsy. But this week, though, we're holding back. We're holding back. See, we, we had another intro. I'm kind of glad we re-recorded. I'm kind of glad that we dropped it. First of all, I just want to say, Bill, I'm really glad that you're here. The last few weeks, you know, I listened to the podcast at least twice, taking notes, uh, f- filling out the show notes and all that. You added the thing, and I've realized that probably 90% of the really good humor comes from your side of the desk. <laughs> I, I'm starting to feel like maybe you should... Did, did we say this already on this episode? Did we say this? Or was I, that on the previous intro I about you know. starting your like own inception. podcast? This is like an inception. Okay, uh, what day thing. is it? No, but we we talked about you starting your own podcast, more remote, less less pressure, or maybe some kind of conspiracy. Um, yeah, it was podcast. a uh, remote, less pressure. I think so. There's still more pressure than there is on ours. So, but there's not less pressure than there is on ours. No, there'd be more pressure because ours is no pressure. No pressure. Mine would be less pressure. Oh. But in comparison to what? If you don't know the context of this amount of pressure. What kind of pressure is less pressure then? It's all subjective. Exactly. You know, I mean, what what point of the pressure are you in that you need less? That's exactly my point. And then also, I was going to be the flip of this where I would be a conspiracy podcast talking about fly fishing on occasion, where we're a fly fishing podcast talking about conspiracy on occasion. So wow. our crowds probably wouldn't intertwine, you know? Yeah. So but what, we what? might get a lot of conspiracy nuts into fly fishing, which would be great. Playing the gym bay. Playing the ghost gym bay. <laughs> hey, they have the gym bay. They have UFOs and occasionally go fly fishing. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about a po- quality podcast. That's a quality podcast that I want to be a part of. But in all seriousness, in all seriousness, this week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited. But before we do that, in other news. Oh, wait. Whoa, whoa. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait. There's a... <laughs> Man shares FBI tip, in quotes, FBI tip, just the tip, for getting someone to say yes to any question you ask. A TikTok user has gone, okay, so this is kind of Bush League, okay? Me being in sales my entire life, I already kind of knew this. I was kind of disappointed by the article, but I guess if you're not in sales your entire career, you may not know this. But this is actually a Dale Carnegie, one of his uh, first things that he teaches you in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay, but they act like this is all cool and stuff. And, and, and like I said, I was kind of disappointed when I read it. But man shares FBI tip for getting someone to say yes to any question that you ask. Bill, would you like the power to have people to say yes to any question that you ask? Is this the trick to get me to say yes because you just asked me a question? <laughs> Do you like burgers, Bill? Yeah. What? Do you ever You're a genius. <laughs> Do you ever want to eat? That's obvious. Everybody wants to eat. Okay, let me ask you again. Do you like burgers? Yeah. Do you like to eat? Yeah. 
do you want to go to McDonald's? No. It didn't work. Oh. But, but that's the example that he says. He says, you know, uh, according to the mirror.uk, this guy goes on the TikTok and he tells people, he, I guess he is an FBI agent, I guess, quote unquote. And he says, just have people say yes two times. And then the third question, they're more likely to say yes because it's a string of yeses, just like Dale Carnegie taught. Um, Maybe the trick then would be four yeses. Maybe four. Maybe the four yeses, right. but we'll, we'll have the link down below. Uh, and you guys are free to comment. Uh, how many yeses does it take before someone will say yes? I wish I'd, I wish I'd have known that back in the bar days when I was trying to pick up women. Like four yeses or, or even two yeses. It, 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 uh, no yeses for me. Are you talking about yeses or drinks? Uh, several several <laughs> of the... I forgot where we were. Because- <laughs> that happened a lot too. <laughs> How many drinks before she says yes? <laughs> I digress. Hey, but below you can find the link to mirror.co, mirror.co.uk to the article. Uh, and you too can find out how to get someone to go to McDonald's with you. Because who doesn't <laughs> like going to McDonald's? We should go to McDonald's. You know what? I think I'm going to go to McDonald's now. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. <laughs> hey, did you ever see a Dave Chappelle episode where he gets a job? He no. got a job. I didn't. Oh, dude, you got to watch. It's hilarious. They talk about how McDonald's pulls people out of poverty. <laughs> it's really funny. I highly, highly recommend it. But this week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited to have Mr. Steve Ramirez. He uh, wrote the book Casting Forward. He he considers himself the Texas Buddha, which he says tongue in cheek. He doesn't really, he doesn't demand that we call him that or anything, you know. But he, you know, he's just kind of like that Namaste guy, you know. He's he's relaxed, but he can kill you. That's what's interesting. Bill, do you think you could take him? Me. Yeah, you, dude. I mean, maybe. No, no, there's no way. Because he was military and uh, I I was not. At our first live uh, event in Texas, we're going to do like a ring where you like get up against Steve Ramirez. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's, uh, All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I can take him. No, nah, but... um. Just to read some of the things that that uh, he has here, um, some of the people that wrote the forward, um, you know, we have Kirk Dieter, Ted Williams, Chris Wood, uh, our friend um, Bob White also did the illustrations. I mean, it's it's you know he talked a lot about how he's happy because it sold sold so many, can touch so many people. But I think mm-hmm. the reason that it sold so many is because his 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 crew is so awesome. Like the people that yeah. he surrounded himself and like people say, uh, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you the future. Mm-hmm. And that's what I learned at Amway. Um, but no, I'm just, I'm totally kidding by that, by the way. <laughs> Quick star. Quick star. No way. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I sold Mary Kay for a brief period of time. <laughs> got myself a Cadillac. <laughs> I got myself a pink Cadillac. Play, faces take you places. That's what they say. Faces take you places. But now I'm very excited to have Mr. Steve Ramirez on the show talking about his book, Casting Forward with Lions Press. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very excited to have um, someone that I, I've, I've kind of followed you at a distance on social media. We have a lot of mutual friends and things like that, but it's really, really good to have uh, Steve Ramirez here on the podcast. It, it's Ramirez, right? Did I pronounce that correct? You do as well as I can, because I pretty much say Ramirez, y'all. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, I've been out of Texas for 20 you, you years, did, Steve, so it's you, hard for me to... You did a great job. Steve Ramirez, y'all. Now about that, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't say it properly. So, <laughs> you know, I met I met someone you, up you here. You got it right. I, I met someone up here recently at a sushi place. We have sushi, believe it or not, in, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was talking to him, and he was half Asian and he was half Mexican, and he acted like that was some kind of novelty. But I'm from Houston. Everyone's half Mexican and half Asian in Houston. You don't know what anyone <laughs> is, you know. And and three quarters of them are last right, name is Ramirez. Right. So you think I'd be able to pronounce that by now? So, but thank you so yeah, much for. It's ha- like when I when I was in West Africa. <laughs> did you live in West Africa? I was just gonna. I did, and uh, you know, there's certain names there. They they named their children in the area that I was in by the day of the week that they're born. Are you serious? And so a lot of kids seem to be born. Yep, a lot of kids seem to be born on Monday. If you yell coffee in parts of West Africa, everybody turns around. <laughs> so that's pr- that's pretty much the same as Ramirez here. You're telling me that, you, okay, your name is determined 
by the 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 day you were day you were born. So you you got a one in seven chance that you're gonna be named <laughs> the same as someone. That's crazy. That's wild. I want, what's the logic? Did they ever share the logic with you, Steve, or was it just kind of like, yeah, it's just what we do? It's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> it made as much sense as some of the things that we do. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. Uh, well, this week, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to have you, Steve. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your book, Casting Forward, um, with Lion Press, correct? Am I, am I correct on that? Yes, Lion's Lion, Press. Lion's Press. Lion's Press. Um, and you you had some good feedback. I mean, you had Kirk Dieter on there uh, that gave you an endorsement there that wrote uh, some, you know, a lot, a few, a, several people wrote some very nice things about you. Illustrations by Bob White, who has, is one of my favorite people I've ever met in my mm-hmm. life. Um, it, but what, Me too. How, how did this how did this happen? I, I, how did this book happen? How did it come about, Steve? Well, uh, this book came about because uh, my daughter and I ended up at a I had been writing for years and writing's just part of who I am. I can't. If I'm not writing, I'm not breathing. So, uh, but she got to a point, she finished her bachelor's degree at Vanderbilt and, and I was, uh, it just went through another situation where if you've ever worked for government, sometimes the politics changes and suddenly the funding shifts sure. and everything you've worked on for five years is just gone. Uh, and she said to me, she said, so dad, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going fishing. <laughs> we're going to fish for a year all over the hill country. And we're just going to let life unfold. Uh, and we did. It all worked out. It always does. So, uh, but part of it is my passion for the Texas Hill Country that I wanted to write something about the Hill Country. Uh, and this is actually one of a series of books. The second one, uh, Casting Onward, will be coming out beginning of next year. That's fantastic. And if, uh, if, so, yeah, that's, how it, it, that's how it started. That's amazing. That's great. And, and that's how it started. It's just us. T- <laughs> we have a pause. <laughs> We're waiting for each other. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. No yeah we have a, we had a, we had a, I think they call it a pregnant pause. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we just decided, I said, I decided we're going to hit every major river in the Texas Hill country. All the ones we haven't done, all the ones we have done. Uh-huh. And, uh, but the other thing about this is it's, I really loved it when Ted Williams wrote the forward. He sent it to me and I read it and I am not afraid to say I teared up a little bit <laughs> because he nailed it. Wow. Uh, I'm a writer that fishes. I'm uh-huh. not a, I'm not an angler that can, that writes. And right. this is a book that has fishing in it mm-hmm. an adventure, I hope, but it's not just, it's not just fishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's about, it's about what we're going through now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, think I, about it. There's <laughs> so much going on in the world right now and we're adjusting. Right. Absolutely. And I, I think Kurt Dieter described that to Aaron Reed the same way. He's a writer that happens to fly fish, you know, um, in, in I'm a, I'm a songwriter that happens to fly fish as well, but it, it's something about the creative type. And I've, I've said this a million times on this podcast. It's, it's, it's sickening how many times people are probably sick of hearing me say it, but the people who fly fish tend to be a creative bunch, you know, um, tend to find inspiration there than, than, you know, throwing a Zebco 202 with a, a worm on it. And I'll do that with my kid every once in a while, but I, I prefer fly fishing, you know, and it seems to attract, the. Uh, the romantic type of people, you know. Um, I totally agree. I, uh, the last handful of years when I started writing this book and then wrote the second one in which I'm fishing with Kirk Dieter and a bunch of other people, I've met the best people of my life. Yeah. No doubt about it. Best people of my life. Friends that I'll have forever. Uh, we've met just like this. And then I jump on a plane and we go fishing somewhere. Uh, and you've got that common ground. It doesn't matter what the generation is. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it doesn't matter. We we just end up having the same kind of general. It's definitely finding your tribe. 
Yeah, I feel that no way. I feel that way a lot with people that I meet um, through the podcast. You know, I've met a lot of people through the years. I mean, this is our fourth season, so some people I keep in touch with very closely, and some people I don't. But if I ran into them, it would be like an old friend. You know, last summer I was down in Texas, um, down in Austin, and, and with several people that we met online, and we all got together and went fly fishing. And it is, it's like your tribe. And even though you're thousands of miles away, it's like when you're on the river, you you kind of get each other. You kind of know. Like, yeah, you're, you're one of me, you know, <laughs> so it's pretty cool to, to, uh, to do that. So now there's a lot of people that we all process things differently. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions on this. Some people, um, like me, I'm a very open book. I, I'm an overshare, you know, I, I I'm an overshare. I, I think I have this false idea that people really care about, about how I feel or like my past and my, and then some people, and I think sharing that uh, oversharing helps me process. I care. I, care. I know. I know. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone cares. You know, I, I know I'm not trying to be whatever, yeah. but what, what I, I, I just want you to know, I do care. I, I appreciate that, Steve. And, and I, a lot of my friends care and I care about them, but some people, uh, instead of sharing, they actually hold stuff in. And, and one of the things that you had mentioned, you don't like to go into detail about the PTSD and your, and your background and things like that. But, but it seems like, like with your book, um, some of the things that you've gone through has helped create a depth inside of you that you, you couldn't have written this book when you were 22 years old. Am I right? That is a great observation. And it's so true. And I don't mind talking about the PTSD. The book talks about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, no doubt in my mind, fly fishing in nature and the good people I meet in it has saved my life. And that's not hyperbole. I would not be alive breathing right now because of PTSD. And I wanted to come out about that and tell people you're going to be okay because there's so much of it out there. There's so much of people struggling uh, I did volunteer with Project Healing Waters as well. And that's because I know what it can do for you. You're right. Fly fishing attracts depth. Pardon the pun. <laughs> Even when we're in the shallows. Uh, but yeah, uh, I have often said to people that I spent 35 years of my life armed uh, for a reason. And 35 years of my life dealing with the absolute worst in humanity. And I am having so much fun now hanging out with great people and going fishing and all the things that seem important to others don't seem important at all to me. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah, for sure. I, absolutely. 100%. Now, um, what is up with the Texas Buddha? Is it the, how, how did you, are you, do you practice Buddhism? <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, what is it? Namaste y'all or something like that. That's kind of like your thing. Um, how did you come up with that? And, and, and are you yeah. a Buddhist? Is that what you practice? It's just, um, actually, I don't belong to any organized religion anymore. Okay. Uh, but uh, where it came up with the Texas Buddha, first of all, in the, in the Marine Corps, I spent a lot of time involved in the martial arts. Okay. And, um, and as much as I was uh, involved in the combative part of it, it was really the more spiritual, philosophical part that I enjoyed the most. And I did read a lot about Buddhism and a lot of it really speaks to me. If you're a fly fisher, you're an angler. One of the things I love about fly fishing is we're always moving. Mm -hmm. I'm just not really the bobber guy. Uh, though I did do it at Pyramid Lake. Uh, but for the most part, I'm not the bobber guy. And uh, we're moving. We have to pay attention to the river. We have to, we're, we're flowing while it's flowing. That's very, very much part of that philosophy. So tongue in cheek, I created the imperfect Texas Buddha uh -huh. because I'm way imperfect, way imperfect, <laughs> <laughs> but I am always working at it. And uh, part of what's in this book and in the next book and in the third one I'm writing now is how we stay resilient. You what? know, uh, as a Buddhist saying that I posted today, actually <laughs> that uh, and I'm going to butcher it, but, uh, I said I was imperfect. You can sweep the floor as a as a slave, or you can sweep the sweep the floor as a free person. It's really your choice. Mm. Uh, fly fishing, I practice with that. Uh, when I tangle something in a tree, which I am known to do, uh, that's my practice: being calm. So that's the imperfect Texas Buddhist because I I am always learning to be present and to put things in perspective. And uh, we want to keep this light. 
and I am light. I will tell you, I laugh every single day. I make sure of it. I could be on fire and I'll laugh on my way down to the ground to drop her up and roll. So <laughs> now, so I don't know if I, I really answered your question that much. But. Theoretically, theoretically, if you ran into Wild Bill, let's say in an alley, okay, could you could you kill him without a gun? You think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I would probably say, hey, you want to want to get a beer? <laughs> I know I, that's not the question I'm uh, asking you, Steve. I want to know how much wait, of a is badass that how you're going to try to take know. you down. Though? I, I yeah, is that a trick question? <laughs> 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 that's what we're trying to find out and, how much of a badass I, you are there were times I thought that would be my downfall too so <laughs> what, what would be your downfall going for a beer and Come then, then so, uh, <laughs> six days later we uh, wake up in Vegas yeah, I'm, knows, just lure, you know. I'm luring him in <laughs> missing a tooth <laughs> I'm luring him in Slip, slipping so, uh, a roofie <laughs> no but I mean like, know, the martial I'm, arts I'm going mean, to answer you I'm going to answer your question. Okay. I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to answer it and probably not the way you want me to, <laughs> which is uh, before I stepped into this life, all my friends were various military special operations people. And a lot of them went on to say paramilitaries and others like that. And I can tell you every single one of them were nice guys. Sure. They all, they all happened to be guys at that uh -huh. time. And uh, if you've really got, if you know what you're doing, you don't have anything to prove. So you see me smiling. So the answer is, yeah, I could <laughs> kill you. It's pretty sweet. I say as I laugh. I say as I laugh. Uh, uh, that's but I wouldn't. Awesome. No, no, you wouldn't. But you could. I mean, it's got to feel. I think there is this um, saying that says it's better oh. to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in the war. Do you know what I mean? Namaste. Right? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. But Namaste, y'all. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. But do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like you have the ability to kill somebody, but you're just kind of chilling. And I think it's, it's better to be a, a a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. See? Right. See, I, I'm not I gonna, know I'm, some I'm not going to get heavy with you here, but the way I make my the way I feel about it is it's better to be – I'm able to defend people. Mm -hmm. See, does that sound better than kill people? I guess <laughs> a little yeah, less. Yeah, it's uh, not fun. I know. But. That's the Buddhist way, because Buddhist Buddhism they don't they don't even like kill bugs, right? I mean, because you could theoretically come back as in another life. And I know you don't practice like you know, a, well, or as religion, but they. I mean, are you like vegan? Do you do that whole thing, or is it? I'm just curious. Oh no, I'm a hunter. Okay, All right. <laughs> no, I, I'm a hunter. Okay, so I've, I, I've, yeah, I've, I've hunted Africa. So, oh, so no. sweet, sweet. Oh, uh, and I, and uh, yeah, and so, and the pH enjoyed that I could make the shots at 600 yards. So, um, but the, uh, so no, I'm not that kind of pacifist. I, I, I'm eating chicken tacos when we're done here. So. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Now you so, live in Bernie, is that right? I'm uh, just. Do you live in, yes, in the Texas Hill Country? And, and that's like we got a lot of good barbecue Barney, in Bernie, is, right? There's a lot of good barbecue in Texas. I know. Uh, then again, I'm <laughs> I'm really you know I you're know. from Houston, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just yeah, down there's there. There's a lot of bar, this, a lot of good bar. This past summer, I was there, and and I just I was by myself before I met with the guys, and I just kind of went on a barbecue binge for like a day. I went to quite a few places. It was amazing. You know, yeah. So I, I'll I'll tell you I do know. Uh, <laughs> I have to warn people when they come down here to fish with me because uh, I'm not hardcore. Okay. I want to have fun. So if I'm fishing by myself, which is a lot of the time, I I've already planned it around barbecue or tacos <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. So I'm going to be on the Lano River for a morning, and then I'm going to end up at uh, up in Mason at the taco place and uh, having them bring me wine. So. Yeah. Why not? I can always go back to fishing afterwards. Yes. I mean, it's never too, too, so. uh, busy for tacos and wine. <laughs> do you pay now? Do you pair no, the, no. Do, you, do you pair the tacos with certain wine? Like do you do like with beef tacos, you pair that with like a cab or do you not that picky on that whole thing? Well, of course I do. I'm not an animal. <laughs> <laughs> So we should, instead of doing yeah, shots I, I, like we did with uh, Aaron Reed, maybe we should have did tacos and like a wine pair, you know, 
So how do you, well, I guess we didn't prepare for it, but I would have done it. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, th- there is a, it's kind of how you feel it. So, uh, there's definitely a, 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 a the season too, by the way, uh, if it's uh summer in Texas and 106 degrees while you're fishing, then you tend to go for white wine. Sure. Sure. Or a really cool micro brew. Yeah. So now we've you- moved right off of fish- fishing and Buddhism and pacifism to beer. <laughs> <laughs> like this, you're my kind of guy. Now, now you said you had a micro brew we were going to drink tonight. Is there a certain one that you had in mind or a certain one that you uh, that like better than the other ones? I didn't. Okay. No, we d- I didn't bring it. Okay. Because um, we we're planning to do that together. So uh, it would be another time. Another time. But, uh, no, I just happened to have one and, and uh, another time. Oh, hopefully there'll be another time. <laughs> so, uh, but I have to say, I, I, I probably am a little snobby when it comes to going, when I, when I travel somewhere, I want to have what they're brewing and making right there. Okay. Whether it be wine or whatever. Uh, I want that food. It's like coming to Texas. You want Texas barbecue, right? Sure. Sure. You're not, you're not looking for Memphis barbecue. If you're in Memphis, you want Memphis barbecue. Right. So uh, we've, we're getting very deep here. Yeah. Now, are you a real ale, uh, real ale fan from Blanco, Texas? Our real spirits, Davin Topol's outfit there. Are you familiar with him at all or not? I just not much, okay. not much. I'm just so, curious. I'm definitely more of, I'm definitely more of a wine guy, but, okay. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but you know, most people don't realize, and I, I, sh- I should not keep saying this because so many people are moving down here, but most people don't realize that Texas Hill country is a great vineyard country. Right. And that we have quite a few microbreweries uh, and you can drive a few minutes in any direction and find live music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to really stop telling people this about the great <laughs> fishing and, <laughs> because there won't be any room anymore. And right now I've been fishing here for decades and I have only ever once run into another angler. Wow. Um, I, I tend to do the backwaters, you know, way up in the headwaters. I don't tend to do where everybody else goes. And I ran into another angler on my favorite spot one time. And uh, I felt like someone was with my wife. <laughs> I just looked at him like, what are you, what are you doing in my fishing spot? So, <laughs> Well, I was down there, like I said, last summer. I think you get what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Fishing down there. Like I, like I said, I grew up, I spent the, um, I spent summers at camp in the hill country in Kerrville, uh, camp pearl wheat for anyone that's ever been over there. So I would spend my summers in the, um, there. And then we'd always go to new Braunfels a couple of times in the summer, you know, but I never really grew up fishing there. And one of the things when I was back there this summer as an adult, as an angler, it was really frustrating just trying to find access to water uh, because everything is, pr- you know, private there, uh, especially, you know, on the, is it the Kamal and all that. Like it's, it's really hard to like, just get on the water. Um, is that the case? Like all throughout the hill country, a lot of it's private. Uh, and can it you is. speak to us a little bit about that? Cause we have, we had just such an abundance of access in Michigan. It was very frustrating to, to do that. Right. Yeah, I actually wrote a whole chapter on that in the book. Um, one of the things that I'm really pushing for is we need more public land in Texas. And I'm really worried that if we don't start changing that in the hill country right now, all you're going to have is rooftops. Hmm. So, uh, but it is a problem. And uh, there's a part in, in the book, uh, each chapter is named after a river. And, and San Saba, one of the things that came up in that was the lack of access to get to that river. Hmm. The other thing is how it's drying up. But uh, I kept going to places where you're supposed to have access and there was barbed wire across the river, which is not even legal for them to do. Mm -hmm. But when you got to places where there was access, people were not treating it well. Hmm. So I found a place and people had thrown their trash there. And uh, so I understand why these ranchers do that. So the way it works in Texas is once you get into the river, you can go up and down it as far as you want, uh, but you've got to get that point. Yeah. So they, or you've got to paddle down it. They don't own the actual riverbed. You can, you can wade that, but you just yeah. have to be able to get on it somewhere. That's how it works. Right. And that's the problem. And you're exactly right. It's difficult to get access 
many places. So tell us about your next book. It's Casting Onward. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Can you go in a so, little bit of uh, detail about that? Yeah. And that's coming out in uh, 2022, uh, spring of 2022. And it was originally going to be the end of this year, but with COVID and everything, it's gotten moved to spring. So I think it's hilarious. It's perfect for me. It's going to be out on April Fool's Day. <laughs> um, so... April 1st of 2022 is called Casting Onward. And what I did is I, I conceived the second one from the series where I was going to travel around the, the United States, all different watersheds, meet up with people like you that were meeting like this. Mm -hmm. uh, we become friends and we go off and I learn your, your waters mm -hmm. from you. And I was focused on native fish. I can't say just native trout because I also did warm water and two chapters of salt water. Okay. I was fishing off Cape Cod with Ted Williams, uh, which was an amazing experience. If anybody here has ever fished with Ted, he is the toughest angler I've ever known. <laughs> Next time I will be combatively ready. We're, we're planning to go again and I will have my, I will have my camel back on so I can keep my fluids going because he does not stop fishing. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I went from place to place, state to state, all across the United States. Uh, it's a long list of states. Uh -huh. And we went after native fish. And that's, and that's, and so the, you and wild, wild Bill having a conversation. No, not at all. No, I'm actually just looking at my notes um, while you're talking there. So, um, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so, sorry. We're casting forward is a different. I'm sorry. We're casting forward is a different river. Uh -huh. This one is different fish, different watersheds, different people. So Kirk Dieter has, he's in three chapters. Okay. Um, uh, Ted Williams and I have another chapter. It's, it, and it's, it's heavily involved with Trout Unlimited as well. Not, it's not a Trout Unlimited book, mm -hmm. but a lot of my friends that I fish with are with Trout Unlimited. And they took me out and showed me those waters. And uh, the first chapter actually is with Chris Wood. Uh, the president of Toronto Limited, and right. I flew out to Washington, and we fished with rope flies for garfish. Wow! Uh, and for for two days, and we didn't even see a fish. <laughs> so, and yeah. I had a great time. I had a great time. <laughs> now um, it says here Ted Williams almost killed you. Um, was that off the coast of Cape Cod? I didn't say that. It oh, does not just, say that. I know it says how it Ted Williams nearly killed me. No, nearly fished me to death off the coast of Cape Cod. Sorry. <laughs> I'm yeah, totally kidding. But, but, but is that what you're referring to? Is just the hardest fisherman? Just what was that like? I mean, you guys are just up in the, the crack of the well, I gotta tell fishing you, hard. Or? I, I owe Ted so much. He has been such a great friend, such a great guy. He is tough. He is tough. And when I first flew up there, his wife, who's wonderful, Donna, she said, uh, you're going to get to be in the book now. And I said, what book? <laughs> the I Survived Fishing with Ted Williams book. <laughs> and I'm going back. We're talking about where I was going to go in June, but now I think we're moving it off to September for Albies. But uh, I wasn't prepared for how tough this man is. And he, he knows it. So wow. what we did is we got out there off Cape Cod and we fish for blues and stripers. And when I mean fish, you catch, you release, you catch, you release until the fish are worn out. Oh. And then he says, hold on. <laughs> and you go to the next spot and you catch and release and you catch. I long since forgot how many fish we caught. Wow. And my, he was just fine. My arms were dead. Uh -huh. <laughs> my arms were completely <laughs> dead by the end of the day. Uh, I couldn't have done a push up oh. and it was nothing for Ted, nothing at all. So we were driving home. So we, I got, we hit the rack at 1130 at night. We were on the road at two in the morning. We were on the water for sunrise and we fished until there was no fish left to catch. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> and it was just an easy, it was just an easy day for him. <laughs> it was, it was day, an right? easy day. And I was thinking, wow. Yeah, it was just Tuesday. It was an easy day for him. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget what a great day we had. Oh, wow. That's great. So, But uh, I'll, I'll also never forget the seals coming up and looking at us like, why do you keep throwing the food away? 
uh, <laughs> because we were catching them and releasing them so fast. Wow. So, One other question I have for you here. Um, one final question for you. You know, you'd mentioned that you lived um, in West Africa. You, you've lived in a lot of places. You've, you've traveled the world. Um, you love the hill country and that's your, that's your place there. Um, but how has having that global, um, experience that global, um, that global experience, how does that, how did that affect you in writing your book? And, and just as a person being exposed to all those different cultures and different ideas and thoughts, how, how did that affect your writing and how does it affect you as a, as a human being there? That's a great question. Um, I am so lucky. So just in the Marine Corps alone, I've traveled a lot since then, but even in the Marine Corps alone, I did almost 30 country, I'm uh, sorry, over 30 countries in, in three years, five years total, um, all across Africa, Europe, uh, down into South America, Peru. And what it's done is, first of all, you, you learn that there's a lot of good places in the world. There's a lot of beautiful places. Mm-hmm. I've learned that the people tend to be the best thing and some of the worst things you meet. Uh, they, they save your life and they'll take your life in a heartbeat. Mm. It just depends on where you're at. I've learned all of that. I've learned that I love my country, but there's a lot of people that live. Um, you know, I lived in Italy for about a year and a half and uh, that's a much more relaxed way of living. Uh, they're they're into hanging out together and having food and wine and song and they're not into uh, careers at least when I was there. So I learned a lot about the world. I learned a lot about compassion, but I also learned how rough it is. Mm. So I've lived in places where uh, where life is really really cheap. You know, yeah. That's that's what I'll say. It's really really cheap. I live in places where you know, they they shoot people and that they fall where they fall and that's where they stay. So when I hear people complaining in America, I think <laughs> no one's shooting at you. You're having a great day. Yeah. <laughs> You're having a great day. I am I am always optim positive. You know, I, I uh, seriously. That's a great question. It's really affected me in understanding a broader view of the world what's important and what's not. Mm-hmm. So many things people get upset about. I think ah, that's nothing. Just relax. It's going to be fine. <laughs> I've been on a burning plane over the Congo. I'm not worried. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you. That's hanging a true out. story, by the way. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about that. So tell me what happened. Cause I'm not going to just let you go like that, Steve. So you're on a burning plane on the Congo. Was it in the military or were you, was this like a commercial flight? I was or? in the military, but it, it was a commercial flight though. I was in the military. Okay. But, uh, and then back then I used to, I used to grow my beard out and try not to look military as I traveled and <laughs> carried two passports. I had a diplomatic one and a regular one. Uh, it's, it's not that big of a story. I just, the engine caught on fire coming out of Nairobi uh-huh. and uh, we turned, we turned around and had to fly with a flaming engine for 20 minutes to get back to the airport. Wow. And this is Africa. Right. Uh, so what I mean is <laughs> we sat on the tarmat for over three hours while they fixed that same engine. And we talk off on the same plane to cross the Congo to oh. Yaoundé, Cameroon. <laughs> See, that's the story. <laughs> that's we flew the across story. the Congo. <laughs> so, so that's why I said it's not that big of a story. It's just a burning engine. Uh, but uh Oh, wow. Of course, everybody praying all the way down wasn't so helpful. But, yeah. <laughs> but even then I said, we're, we're, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> if I could live through this, God, I will do anything you ask me to. Um, well, Hey, I really appreciate I'm it. I'm going to die. I'm going to die really stupidly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I really appreciate y'all inviting me. Yeah, for sure. Um, Can, if, if people wanted to find out more you. about your books, wanted to find out more about you, um, could you just give us a link on where they could find you and your books and, and what you're up to, Steve? Sure. I have a, a website, which is just Steve Ramirez author.com. Okay. So Steve S T E V E Ramirez R M and, and that I'll be keeping people up on that. Casting forward is in its second printing right now. Uh, I'm really thrilled that the first printing sold out really fast. Awesome. Um, I don't say that because of selling. It's because I love it that people seem to be enjoying it. 
Mm. I put three years of my life into that book. Mm. So uh, I love it. I'm getting letters from people saying that this book really helped me. Mm. That makes me feel good. So uh, the website is a great way to, to, to connect with me. And I'm out there on social media. And as you know, I'm not all that shy about it. Well, we really so. appreciate you being on, Steve. We'll be sure to put the links down below. So if you're following us on, on the Remote No Pressure website, you can click down below to find the links. Um, also on YouTube, we'll be sure to put your uh, social po- your social links, your website links, um, anything else uh, we, we find on you, some little bit of a picture of your book and things like that that you can find that in the show notes. Um, and I really appreciate it, Steve. And, and I look forward to fishing with you as well next time, uh, either I'm down there or if you're up here, uh, we'll have to hit the river. But I, I genuinely appreciate your time and I genuinely appreciate what you're doing uh, for the community of fly fishing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm truly honored. I mean it for both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you have a great night, Steve. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this week on the Remote No Pressure Podcast. Thank you to everyone out there for hanging out with us this week on the Remote No Pressure Podcast. Bill, thank you for hanging out with me. It's always a pleasure. You know, we got the six foot rule going on with the whole Mm -hmm. COVID thing coming Mm -hmm. on, but you know what? I'm just kind of glad that in the new studio, we're not right next to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, especially right in the pinnacle of COVID. Right in the pinnacle. We were like right next to each other. And I even got exposed with you. Yeah, yeah, I had it, (laughs) but... You didn't. You never got I it, think, right? I think I got the. I think I got the. Uh, what's it called? Not the vaccination. But what's the other thing? Antibodies. Yeah, I think I think I had it in February. Really? I think I did. Yeah, because I've gotten exposed like five times and I've never gotten it. And then I just had a negative COVID test. God, I hope I don't get COVID by the time this thing airs. That would be well. You know, no, you don't know. No, it's, it's a crazy time right now. To just peel that bandaid off and get it over with. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much <laughs> for hanging out with us. Be sure to go to remotenopressure.com. <laughs> Be sure to go to remotenopressure.com to check out our, our merchandise, our shirts, our t-shirts, everything that's there. It's really cool. Bill, any final thoughts? Any last words? Oh, man. You you totally threw me for a loop. I did not see that coming this week. <laughs> I got nothing. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Until next time, go fishing. <laughs> <laughs>